Charles sent me in advance uh, kind of some remarks about footprint, and I thought, oh, it'd be good to talk about footprint. So this square shows you what would happen if you tried to take all, say, 10 billion people that we'll have uh, on the planet and have them live in cities that are roughly like New York City, the density of, of New York City. So if, and I'm rounding up to, say, 10 million people in New York City in, in, uh, in 1,000 square kilometers. So for 10 billion people, you'd need 1,000 New York City units. So this is the amount of land you'd need to put 10 billion people into, uh, into a city. It's a really pretty small uh, patch of land compared to what we have on Earth. And as people move into cities, we're going to have a much smaller um, impact on the, on the Earth because cities are so dense. But where else could we put them? Well, you know, I, I like the, these coastal climates. So there's a part of Australia that, that's hardly being used and, you know, <laughs> We, we could all have a, you know, we could all have, be pretty close to an, to an ocean view if we did in Australia. Um, another place is Namibia, it's got a great coastline. So, you know, we could, we could just have us all live in, in Namibia. And, uh, you know, one thing leads to another. I started, I started having some fun with this. Um, I said, okay, well, uh, you know, 10 billion, we don't have to put everybody in one country. What, what if we just put a billion people in, in Namibia? So this is a, this is a strip that would uh, hold, uh, 100 New York cities, so uh, a, a billion people. And then you just start to think about what's involved in, in planning for this. What if we had a big plan for let's Let's make room for a billion people to move into a city in, uh, cities in Namibia if they, if they want to. Um, so what would you think about? Well, first, you know, you'd want to save some land for some kind of a transit corridor up and down, um, up and down. Uh, you know, with current high-speed rail, you could transit, it's a thousand, kilometers long, so you could transit this whole distance in about two hours with current high-speed rail. Um, so you'd want to save some room for uh, some kind of a rail corridor. But then, then you think about, well, okay, we could, you could put stops along the way. If you're familiar with the peninsula, you know that a stop on a train will lead to a business center there. So uh, those squares are, um, uh, let's see, there's nine, there are nine New York City units in them. So that would, those would be Metropolitan area is about 90 million people. We don't know if a 90 million person city is going to be a fun place to live in or not. Uh, it, it might turn out to be okay. We haven't tried it yet. But, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't probably want to bet the whole, you know, future on, you know, 90 million person cities. So you could think about, okay, well, let's put, just put three, three rail corridors in there, space them about uh, 33 kilometers apart. So um, this is a picture of a map that was drawn by really one person who was a member of a three-person commission. And if you look, uh, there's just to the left of center, there's a line, uh, some lines that he drew for Fifth Avenue for uh, Manhattan. Um, you can also see 42nd Street uh, running from uh, side to side. These were just lines he drew on the map, and he said, yeah, Fifth Avenue, yeah, it should be 100, 100 feet wide, 42nd Street, 100 feet wide. All these existing streets, all these existing lots, yeah, we're just going to blast through all of those. And uh, we're just going to have, uh, the, the law is going to be, the, these are going to be the rights of way, and uh, you know, we're going to take, take the land for these uh, rights of way. They actually didn't even compensate anybody, any of these landowners, when they, when they took the land. They even charged them money for the pave, paving of the street when the, you know, when the street went through their, their farm. But of course, it was exactly the right thing to do because the landowners became fabulously wealthy because this land became much more valuable when you put, you put streets through it. But, you know, everybody, there was a kind of a Tea Party sort of revolt in 1811 to this, this commissioner's plan for New York City. At the time, the government just didn't, didn't respond to that revolt. And then once everybody started making money, they stopped complaining. <laughs> but, um, but if you hadn't been willing to set aside, say, 100 feet, of uh, basically block, uh, building face to building face, you wouldn't have been able to have a successful city in, um, in New York. And, and what's still remarkable to me about this plan in 1811 was that it was made at a time when people didn't even know what a bicycle was. So like, what are you gonna do with a Fifth Avenue that's 100 feet wide? What's gonna go up and down that thing? So, I don't know, but you know, <laughs> you know people will figure out some good, good way to, to use it. I mean. Sidewalks, I don't know, uh, you know vehicles, uh, pipes, I don't know. This is 42nd Street uh, with this 100 feet from block face to block face. A lot of it devoted to, to sidewalk. Uh, 
I don't think there's a bike, you can't see a, uh, a bike lane, but notice that there's a, there's a bus. And this is, this is actually very important. This is Wall Street, you know, the symbol of modern successful capitalism. It's this crappy little street. It's always been crappy, it always will be crappy. It'll never get better because there was no plan to make Wall Street wide enough to be functional. And part of what the commissioners were trying to do in 1811 was to make sure that we don't do the same problem, but don't make the same mistakes we made in the early development of Lower Manhattan because we didn't protect enough public space to have a successful interaction between all the people who were gonna settle here. So it warns us that the decisions we make about public space for interaction and connectivity are, are basically permanent. Now, to go back to my kind of scaling plan, the, the white square here shows a, a, a one kilometer square in Manhattan. You can see that uh, if you have your main arterials separated uh, at, at a distance of about one kilometer, that's actually pretty far apart from the point of view of a dense city. You know, in New York City, you've got um, Fifth Avenue on the right, then Sixth, Seventh, and Eighth, all passing vertically up and down through this one, uh, one kilometer square. Then you've got 42nd as a wider um, cross street, then 34th, 23rd as other wider cross streets. Um, those are not separated in New York by a, by a full kilometer. But so it's, it's not, it's probably not adequate, not ambitious enough to say, let's at least make sure that the, the land for arterials um, that we save is no more than a, a kilometer apart, but at least it would be better than, than doing, doing nothing at all. So again, think of this kind of grid, but now think of it not as a thousand uh, New York cities, but think of this as a single New York City-like unit where each square is a one kilometer super block and all of the lines are arterial roadways, you know, roughly the, the size of, uh, of Fifth Avenue uh, or 42nd Street, big enough for sure so that, for example, a bus could go up and down uh, the street. This means that nobody lives more than a, a half a kilometer walking distance away from a street where they could catch a bus and, and get to their job. Now, here's a, here's a picture of, uh, of Bangkok. Uh, to get, and to give you a, a sense of scale, here's my one kilometer square grid, uh, and a, thousand, uh, a thousand grids for, uh, for Bangkok. You know, if you had 90 meter or 30 meter wide uh, rights of way on about this scale, it wouldn't be that hard to get around in, in Bangkok. As you know, Bangkok is, you know, incredibly congested and dysfunctional, but it's because they didn't make any provision for this kind of public space for um, connectivity. What, um, you know, what they have instead are some superhighways that have been sort of uh, houseman style blasted in on top of the existing uh, development. But those, those both divide up the city in a very harmful way and don't give you the flow that you need through your, through your traffic grid. I think one of the things that's hard about urbanization is the time scales. It's not that hard to plan for a successful New York City. You really just lay out a grid of that public space, and then just kind of stand back and let people do their thing. And as that unfolds, it will look messy. This is a picture in New York City where you can see new buildings that were being built on the grid that uh, somebody drew on this, on this map. But there was also uh, these, these kind of shanty towns and, and squatters for, you know, for decades as this, as this unfolded. So you would have said, oh God, New York City was a terrible disaster. We should have planned to make sure there were no shanty towns. It's like, as long as you've got the fundamentals in place, just, just be patient. This picture I love, this is Fifth Avenue in 1900. So this is uh, almost 100 years after that plan said, here's where Fifth Avenue is gonna go. This is near, I think, 57th as the, as the cross street. Notice it's still dirt. They haven't even paved it yet. So if you're gonna have this sort of low cost New York City style developments, in, you know, in Namibia or Australia or wherever you wanna do it, you can set the foundations of the protected public space, but then you just have to be patient. And eventually, when people are rich enough and, and interested enough in stuff like paving, they'll, they'll invest in it. So uh, it, 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 the sense that it's impossible to replicate New York City is because people think, well, we want it within 10 years. We want it five years, we want it now. You can't get it now. But if you just do some very low cost, minimal planning, 
and then just let people do what people will naturally do, you could easily get as many New York cities as you want. To close, I, I, I think the real question of our time is, why are we no longer making plans like those people who said in 1811, yeah, we, New York City could have a, a, a million people. It could be the biggest city outside of China, is, is, uh, is what uh, people said then. Why aren't we making any plans on, on that kind of scale? What's happened to our, our ambition and our, our confidence? What's happened to our ability to, to execute? And, and I fear that at the very heart, it's partly the, the, the evidence that we've made mistakes and the environmental mistakes are I think some of the ones that have frightened people the most. And that's already made us cautious. But in addition, um, we've lost the ability to say this is something which is so beneficial for everybody that uh, you, Mr. Individual, don't get to be a holdout and, and resist this. So the, the fact that we can't simply seize uh, private land through something like eminent domain and say, this is gonna be important for the public and uh, too bad, just, you, you, gotta, you gotta just accept it. Um, I think it's, that's the, the signal that of what we've lost, and it's the signal of what we gotta get back if we wanna have the capacity and then the willingness to make plans to deal with the fact that people wanna live in cities and people want uh, to use energy. You know, we're gonna need some plans to, to accommodate those, those desires. And um, maybe I'm getting older, but I, I'm, I'm not as optimistic as I used to be that we can, we can get back that, that, that ambition. Uh, just to, to close with one final point, um, in your comments about legitimacy and justice, I think this is a very important part of the, the equation as well. We'll trust governments with the authority to do things like just take, take land. Um, as long as we have some sense that governments are working truly for public benefit, it's not just capturing private, private benefit. And what's scarce in the world right now are governments that have perceived legitimacy that are truly pursuing the benefit of the, of, of the public and have the capacity to act and say, you know, we're gonna have to do something that'll, that'll actually be beneficial for everybody. And so the, the reason I guess I'm pessimist, pessimistic is I don't know how we can reestablish uh, the, 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 the kind of legitimate, true legitimate and perceived legitimate uh, governments that have a capacity to make decisions. Thanks.